They said China was 10 years behind. They were wrong. In just 14 days, Beijing crossed technological thresholds many believed were still years away, demonstrating transistors beyond the one nanometer barrier without silicon, unveiling AI hardware capable of hundreds of billions of operations per second, and breaking a long-standing fusion density limit inside its artificial sun. This isn't hype, and it isn't coincidence. While Washington was still debating chip export controls, Beijing was already building the future those controls were meant to contain. Let's start with the most important material in modern civilization, silicon. For over 50 years, every smartphone, every server, every AI system, every weapons guidance chip, all of it has been built on one material, silicon. The entire global economy runs on progressively smaller silicon transistors, shrinking predictably every two years in what we call Moore's Law. But here's the problem nobody wants to talk about. Moore's Law is dying. Not slowing down. Dying. The reason is brutally simple. Physics. As transistors approach atomic dimensions, we're talking about structures just a few atoms wide, silicon fundamentally breaks down. Electrons start leaking through barriers they're supposed to respect. This is called quantum tunneling. Power efficiency collapses, heat skyrockets, reliability becomes nearly impossible to guarantee. The current cutting-edge manufacturing node is around 3 nanometers. TESMC, Samsung and Intel are pushing toward 2 nanometers, then 1.4 nanometers. But every step forward costs exponentially more and delivers diminishing returns. Industry insiders have been quietly preparing for this for years. They know silicon has maybe one or two more generations left before it hits a wall that money and engineering cannot break through. Now, here's where geopolitics enters the picture. The United States, through its allies and export controls, has effectively monopolized access to the most advanced silicon chip manufacturing. TSMC in Taiwan makes over 90% of the world's most advanced processes. ASML in the Netherlands builds the only machines capable of producing chips below 7 nanometers, extreme ultraviolet lithography systems that cost over $350 million each. Washington's strategy has been clear. Control the silicon supply chain and you control everything built on top of it. AI development, military systems, economic competitiveness. This is why the CHIPS Act exists. Why Dutch export controls prevent ASML from selling EUV machines to China. Why the entity list keeps expanding. The assumption underlying all of this is simple. Silicon is the only game in town. Control silicon, control the future. But what if that assumption is wrong? What if there's a path forward that doesn't require silicon at all? In early January 2026, researchers at Nanjing University published results in Nature Electronics that changes the entire strategic calculation. They demonstrated working transistors, high-performance, reliable transistors built on two-dimensional semiconductors at scales beyond where silicon can function. And critically, they solved the problem that has killed every previous attempt to move beyond silicon, electrical contacts at the nanometer scale. Let me explain why this matters. The semiconductor they used is molybdenum disulfide, or MOS2. Unlike silicon, which is a three-dimensional crystal, MOS2 can exist as a sheet exactly one atom thick. This atomic thinness provides a fundamental advantage. As transistors shrink, Silicon suffers from what's called short-channel effects. Essentially, the transistor loses its ability to fully turn off, leading to massive current leakage and power waste. Atomically thin materials naturally avoid these problems. In theory, they can scale far beyond silicon's physical limits. But theory is not reality. For more than a decade, researchers worldwide in the US, Europe, South Korea have tried to build functional 2D transistors almost all failed for the same reason, contacts. A transistor needs metal contacts to inject and collect electrical current. As devices shrink to the nanometer scale, those contacts must shrink too. But traditional methods of depositing metal onto 2D semiconductors create rough, defective interfaces. The result? 
electrical resistance skyrockets. Even if the transistor channel itself works perfectly, poor contacts destroy performance. The device becomes useless. For years, the industry focused on shrinking the transistor channel. This research shows that contacts, not channels, are the real limit. Solve contacts and scaling resumes. This contact resistance problem has been the invisible wall blocking progress. It's not dramatic. It doesn't make headlines. But it's the reason 2D semiconductors remained stuck in university labs while silicon continued dominating industry. Until now. The Nanjing team took a completely different approach. Instead of depositing metal on top of the semiconductor, they grew the contact directly on the 2D material using a technique called molecular beam epitaxy, or MBE. In an ultra-high vacuum chamber, they added antimony atoms one by one onto a single layer of MOS2. This slow, controlled process allowed atoms to self-arrange into a nearly perfect crystal structure, bonding intimately with the semiconductor beneath. The result was a clean, atomically sharp interface between metal and semiconductor, something conventional deposition methods cannot achieve. And the performance improvement was extraordinary. The antimony contacts maintained ultra-low electrical resistance even when shrunk to 18 nanometers. Previous 2D transistor contacts began failing at 60 nanometers or more. They measured a transfer length, essentially the critical dimension for electrical contact, of around 13 nanometers. That number is crucial because it meets the requirement for the industry's projected 1 nanometer technology node. No other 2D semiconductor contact technology has convincingly achieved this threshold. Using this contact method, the researchers built what may be the smallest high-performance 2D transistor ever demonstrated with a contacted gate pitch below 40 nanometers. These devices aren't faster than today's best silicon yet, but they work where silicon physically cannot. This isn't a lab curiosity. It places these devices directly in the range targeted by future commercial chip roadmaps. Even more telling, in 2025, IMEC, one of the world's most influential semiconductor research organizations, publicly stated that 2D semiconductors represent the final option for transistor scaling once silicon reaches its limit. Until now, that was mostly theoretical speculation. The Nanjing result provides concrete experimental proof that sub-silicon scaling is achievable. To be clear, this is not a factory-ready chip. It's a laboratory demonstration. But history shows that once the physics works at scale, manufacturing eventually follows. Silicon took decades to move from Bell Labs to mass production. Transistors invented in 1947 didn't appear in consumer products until the 1960s. The question isn't whether 2D semiconductors can be manufactured, it's who will invest in making it happen first. Now consider what this means geopolitically. At a time when the United States and its allies have weaponized access to advanced silicon manufacturing, China has demonstrated a credible pathway that could bypass those controls entirely. If 2D semiconductors can scale to 1 nanometer and beyond while silicon is stuck at 2 or 3 nanometers, then China doesn't need access to ASML's EUV machines. It doesn't need TSMC's fabs. It can leapfrog the entire existing infrastructure. This is not about catching up. This is about changing the game. The second breakthrough from January 2026 came from Peking University. A new computing architecture capable of reaching approximately 500 billion operations per second for specific AI workloads, roughly four times faster than earlier systems while consuming significantly less power. But here's the key detail most coverage misses. This is not a general purpose GPU competitor. It's a domain-specific accelerator optimized for one critical mathematical operation, the Fourier transform. Fourier transforms are everywhere in modern AI and defense systems, image and video processing, radar and sonar signal analysis, wireless communication, medical imaging, autonomous vehicle perception, satellite data processing, Traditional digital processors handle these operations inefficiently because they constantly shuttle data between memory and logic units, a bottleneck known as the von Neumann architecture problem. The Peking team built what they call a multi-physics computing architecture. 
Instead of forcing all computation into standard digital logic, different parts of the calculation run in different physical forms – electrical current, stored charge, or optical signals, whichever is most efficient for that specific step. This approach reduces unnecessary data movement and allows certain calculations to happen naturally at the hardware physics level rather than being simulated digitally. The result, jumping from roughly 1 to 30 billion operations per second to nearly 500 billion without a proportional increase in power consumption. The trade-off is precision. These systems rely on the fact that perception and signal processing don't need perfect accuracy to be effective. For many AI tasks, recognizing objects and images, filtering radar noise, processing sensor data, approximate answers computed quickly are more valuable than exact answers computed slowly. This kind of hardware doesn't replace GPUs. It replaces the most expensive parts of the workload, the perception and signal processing stages that GPUs handle inefficiently. In a modern AI pipeline, GPUs excel at the core neural network training and inference. But before data even reaches the neural network, it needs to be pre-processed. Images need filtering, signals need transforming, sensor data needs cleaning. These pre-processing stages often consume more energy and time than the AI inference itself, and they're exactly where Fourier-based accelerators provide the biggest advantage. Now, companies like NVIDIA and Google dominate today's AI landscape with GPUs and TPUs. These are incredibly powerful and flexible. They can run anything from large language models to physics simulations. But that flexibility comes at a cost. Massive power consumption and heat generation. Even NVIDIA and Google are now exploring specialized accelerators. NVIDIA's DPU, or Data Processing Unit, handles network and storage tasks. Google's TPU is already domain-specific for tensor operations. The Peking University work fits into this global trend, but with a critical difference. While Western companies design specialized accelerators to complement their existing GPU ecosystems, China is building accelerators to bypass the need for cutting-edge GPUs entirely. Remember, export controls prevent China from accessing NVIDIA's most advanced H100 and H200 GPUs. The October 2022 controls specifically targeted AI chips capable of certain performance thresholds. But if you can build domain-specific hardware that achieves comparable or better performance for critical AI tasks, perception, signal processing, sensor fusion, then you don't need those GPUs. This isn't just about commercial AI. This is about autonomous weapons systems, surveillance infrastructure, military communications and signals intelligence. Every one of those systems relies heavily on Fourier-based operations. The third breakthrough is perhaps the most strategically significant. China's Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak, or EAST, their artificial sun, has experimentally exceeded the Greenwald limit for the first time in a fusion-relevant plasma regime. Let me explain why this is a geopolitical game-changer. Nuclear fusion works by heating hydrogen plasma to over 100 million degrees Celsius so atomic nuclei collide and fuse, releasing enormous energy. The challenge is confining this plasma long enough for fusion to occur. Tokamaks use powerful magnetic fields to contain the plasma in a donut-shaped chamber. But for decades, fusion research has been constrained by an empirical rule called the Greenwald limit a maximum plasma density beyond which the plasma becomes unstable and collapses. Higher density is critical because it directly increases the fusion reaction rate. More density means more collisions, more energy output. But pushing density too far traditionally causes turbulence and disruptions that shut the reactor down. So most tokamaks operate conservatively at 80 to 100% of the Greenwald limit. The Greenwald limit was never a law of nature. It was a rule of thumb, and EAST just showed it can be rewritten. EAST has now demonstrated stable plasma operation at 1.3 to 1.65 times the Greenwald limit without triggering instability. This places the experiment in an entirely new operational regime that previously existed only in theory. Critically, this was achieved while maintaining temperatures and magnetic fields relevant to actual fusion reactors, not low-energy lab setups. 
This builds on East's earlier record, sustaining ultra-hot plasma above 100 million degrees for 166 seconds, nearly 18 minutes, a global benchmark for steady-state fusion operation. Pushing density higher makes control harder and materials more stressed, but those are engineering problems, not fundamental physics barriers. Higher density means more energetic particles bombarding the reactor walls. It means more complex magnetic field configurations to maintain stability. It means more sophisticated real-time control systems to prevent disruptions. But these are challenges that can be solved with better materials, more powerful magnets and smarter control algorithms. They're not insurmountable limits. Energy independence is the ultimate geopolitical prize. The country that achieves practical fusion energy first doesn't just gain clean, virtually unlimited power. It gains energy security, no dependence on oil, gas or coal imports. It gains economic dominance, cheap, abundant energy drives manufacturing, AI development, everything. It gains military advantage, nuclear-powered ships and submarines, directed energy weapons, sustained high-energy operations. And it gains climate leverage, the ability to dictate global decarbonization pathways. Right now, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER in France, a multinational collaboration including the US, EU, China, Russia, India, Japan and South Korea, is designed around conservative assumptions that respect traditional density limits. EAST's results suggest that future reactors may be able to operate at significantly higher performance than ITER's baseline design. This means China could potentially build smaller, cheaper or faster to commission fusion reactors than the collaborative ITER approach assumes. And unlike ITER, which is a multinational compromise, EAST is purely Chinese. The knowledge gained stays in Beijing. If China achieves net positive fusion energy within the next decade, before ITER completes testing, it fundamentally reshapes the global order. The United States and Europe would face a competitor with energy abundance while they remain dependent on transitional renewables and residual fossil fuels. Three breakthroughs, three domains, one strategic logic. Beyond silicon, bypass Western chip controls, AI accelerators, bypass GPU export restrictions, fusion density, bypass energy dependence. None of these ideas exist in isolation, but no other country is advancing all three simultaneously at this pace. This is not random. This is coordinated national strategy. While Washington focuses on protecting existing technological advantages, Beijing is investing in the technologies that make those advantages obsolete. The West is playing defense. China is playing a different game entirely. So here's the question. Has China already started winning the technologies that decide the next decade? not by catching up, by changing the rules. The silicon era is ending. The AI hardware landscape is fracturing. Fusion is moving from science fiction to engineering reality. This doesn't guarantee China wins the next decade, but it guarantees the old playbook no longer works. The country that leads in the technologies that come next won't just win economically. It will define the 21st century. What do you think? Is the West underestimating what's happening? Drop your take in the comments. And if you want to understand the real story behind the world's fastest moving tech and geopolitical shifts, hit that subscribe button for daily deep dives. Because the future isn't coming. It's already being built. And right now, it's being built in China.